Father, what a gift it is to celebrate new life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the testimonies. Thank you, God, for these young ones, as was said by Pastor Ben, who I know their parents, I know their commitment to the gospel. Uh, it is such a joy to see them raise their kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and then respond because you have caused them to be born again through the living and abiding word. We celebrate that with great joy, great thankfulness, great gratitude in our hearts, Lord. And now, Lord, we're asking that we as a body may be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, Lord, that we as a body would walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, that we would bear fruit in every good work and we would increase in the knowledge of you, God, that you would be our delight, you would be our joy, you would be our treasure. Whatever it is that you have for us today, Lord, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from your word and fill our hearts and leave us satisfied in your presence, Lord, as, as we are just caught up again in your grace that is overabundant, God. And so however we came in, we leave differently as a result of the work of your word by your spirit. We pray you do that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Well, if you'll uh, stay standing for the reading of God's word, we're going to go to Luke chapter 6 for our reading today. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 20. And we're going to read down to verse 26 today. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 26. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. May the Lord write its eternal truths on your hearts. You can be seated. Church, great morning, huh? So good to be together. Good morning to one and all. If you're new, welcome. So glad that you're here. My name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at Doxa, and we're just delighted to have you. And if you're coming to celebrate a baptism, that is wonderful. Uh, by God's grace, we started doing these like once every six months, and then we started baptizing people once a quarter. And now by God's grace, we'll, we're baptizing once a month. And if God gives us reason, we'll baptize every single week of the year. Amen. And so we are delighted at what the Lord is doing, delighted in the families represented and just so exciting. So praise the Lord. We are in the middle of a series titled Looking to Jesus. What a blessing. If you're here, you are going to be blessed because you are going to get a face-to-face -face glimpse in uh, the face of Jesus and at the foot of Jesus in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, which we began uh, today. And so I'm pretty excited about that. And so the title of the message this morning is Kingdom Blessings. Kingdom Blessings. Or if you've been in church for a while, you might prefer the word Beatitudes. Blessings and Beatitudes, one and the same. Now there's this, uh, there's this iconic scene in the Matrix, okay? Every good sermon starts with a reference to the Matrix, all right? And it's kind of become a little bit of a cultural metaphor. If you follow social media at all, you get this picture. You know what I'm talking about, right? 
It's when Keanu Reeves is offered the choice between a red pill and a blue pill, right? Now, the choice with the blue pill is, man, if you take the blue pill, you can go back, you will wake up in your own bed, and you will find life exactly as you want to believe that it is, right? You get to live in your reality with the way you want it to be, and you just take this blue pill, and we can make that happen. Or if you're willing to take a risk, you take the red pill, and you will learn a potentially life-changing truth by the taking of the red pill, now, today, there's a choice in the text. There is a very much blue pill, red pill dynamic here. There's a blue pill option for you today, which is that you could, especially those coming in to listen to baptisms, right, or, or be a part of this. A lot of times, you're not believers. You don't know much about Jesus. You don't want to hear much about Jesus. You definitely don't want to hear what he says today because he is so stinking clear. And so you're going to blue pill it. You're just going to go, la, 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 I don't hear anything. I don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. And that's a choice to make. Or you take a little risk with you and you take the red pill and you heed Jesus' words here and what will happen is you will become aware of reality from God's perspective. Because what we have here is a kind of spiritual condition assessment tool. Where are you at? Because Jesus is gonna make clear there are some that bear the signs of those that are kingdom bound and that there are other signs that show you are bound from the kingdom. There are some signs that so show you are signs that show you are saved and other signs that show you aren't. There are signs that show you know God and signs that show you don't no matter what you believe to be the truth. Remember red pill versus blue pill. And what Jesus is going to say here is he's simply going to flip everything we know from our culture standards, from conventional wisdom, all of it is going to be flipped upside down. Your perception of reality, your value system, and your understanding of what God blesses could be flipped radically upside down, or maybe I should say right side up by what Jesus says today. And so before we get there, let's, let's start with an outline of what's going on here. And I want to start with the big idea this morning, which I try to give every week to get a sense for what's this passage doing? Why is this here? What's the significance of it? Here's the big idea. Jesus, who we've been talking about this already, is the new Moses, right? The new and greater Moses, who in this text is pronouncing the blessings of spiritual exodus, right? That spiritual deliverance that was long promised to the new Israel, of course, having selected the 12 last week. Jesus, the new Moses, pronounces the blessings of spiritual exodus to the new Israel, to the new people of God. And this is what Luke has been tracking for us, guys, from the very beginning. Luke has been showing us that Jesus is reliving the story of Israel. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by this because the Old Testament pointed forward to a prophet like Moses that was anticipated in Deuteronomy 18 who would mediate a new covenant that we see revealed in Jeremiah 31. And Luke is beginning to show us time and time again that Jesus is the fulfillment of these expectations. So remember last week, he goes up on the mountain to pray. And we recognize the fact that when you read Exodus 19, Moses says the exact same thing, right? He goes up the mountain to pray and he comes down with the revelation of God. That covenant law, that would be the established relationship between God and his people, Moses would bring down from the mountain to the people. And that covenant that Moses brought down was complete with this list of blessings and curses. You remember this in the old covenant. Blessings for those who obey the law and curses for those who disobey the law. You walk in God's ways, you will be blessed. You don't walk in God's ways, you will be cursed. And that's the point of Deuteronomy 28. If you read that whole picture, you get a stunning, clear picture of the expectations and stipulations of the old covenant law. Now what's happening here is Jesus, now with the renewed Israel around him, does his version of the same thing. He went up the mountain and he brings down the revelation of God. Now Moses, it says in the book of Acts, received that revelation from angels. When Jesus comes down, he speaks it out of his own mouth. He doesn't come down holding the 10 commandments on tabs. He comes tablets, he comes down 
preaching from his very mouth as the authoritative one, that law that would establish the people of God in this new covenant, if you will. Now, the Sermon on the Mount's divided into three sections. We're going to cover the first one today, and then the rest of the sections will be covered in the subsequent weeks. And we got four blessings and four woes before us. Almost as if Luke is showing us it's the same sort of picture as what happened in the Old Testament with the blessings that corresponded with obeying the law and the curses. Now, what I want to be clear about here is these are not merely ethical principles. These are pronouncements of salvation. Okay? They're, they're not laws to keep in order to achieve salvation. If you read it like that, these are laws, you got to do them in order to get that salvation. In order to get into the kingdom, you do these things. No, 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 no. That's not what's going on here. Rather, what these are are pronouncements that define the character and conduct of the people already in the kingdom. The kingdom-bound ones bear these characteristics. Kingdom-bound people bear these qualities. Now, of course, the curses bear the same idea but the opposite. The blessings are to the kingdom-bound. The curses are to those bound from the kingdom. Jesus is trying to make it very clear for us today. And in so doing, it's going to leave us with a spiritual condition assessment tool. Where are you at in light of what Jesus reveals here? So we'll start with the blessings. And no surprise, we're just going to work through every single one of them. And so blessings of the kingdom bound. What does it look like? What are the characteristics? What is the conduct of one who is bound for the kingdom, both in it and bound for it in its consummate sense. We've got a lot of coughs today. How you guys doing? You all right? I love it. We just pass it around to each other, right? Uh, man, that used to be awkward like two years ago, right? I feel like for some of us, maybe it still is. Don't worry, I'm not wiping my nose either. I've got six feet, though, around me. You guys, not so much. Yes, but I feel for all of you in there. I feel you. Ugh, ugh. <laughs> all right. Blessings of the kingdom bound. Here we go. Four blessings, one by one. Number one, the blessing of poverty. <laughs> Isaac's going to flip everything on its head, guys. Here we go. The blessing of poverty. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, uh, we need to understand what these are. These are blessings. These aren't, if you want the kingdom, you need to pursue poverty. Right? If it were that easy, then Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die on a cross. Just give everything away. Just be poor. You're like, I could do that. Some of you are like, I can't do that. I'm out already. I need my amenities, right? I need my things. Well, let's work this out. We got to start with that word blessed, okay? We got to understand what that means. And what blessed means is basically Jesus is saying, this is the most beneficial condition. This is the ideal condition for you to be in. In fact, fundamentally, it really means to be approved or to find approval. This is the one that finds approval before God. This is the one who I approve of. Who does Jesus approve of? Blessed are the one who finds approval is the poor. Now, this word poor is a stunningly interesting word. Listen to this. The word here used means to cower and cringe like a beggar. It speaks of someone at such rock bottom that they're reduced to begging, and it's such a shame that they cringe and they cower. Put that picture in your mind for a second. Now, 
Luke gives us the simplest version, right? Blessed are the poor. A lot of times Luke's, Luke gives us the longest version. But we actually get the simpler version of the Sermon on the Mount from Luke, but Matthew gives us the kind of poverty that Jesus is speaking of specifically. Now, it's not that being physically poor isn't a part of what Jesus is saying, but it's more than that. See, the physically poor would be less likely, you know, inclined to trust in themselves, to be more inclined to trust in God, more inclined to heed Jesus' message, more inclined to depend on grace than the one who is rich. But Matthew really gets at the heart of the kind of poverty Jesus is speaking of. Mo Jesus as the new Moses, Jesus as this spiritual deliverer who has come. Matthew describes it as this, blessed are the poor in spirit. that at the heart of it, that's what Jesus is talking about. The poor in spirit are the ones who receive the kingdom. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It's really two-sided. The one who's poor in spirit knows they have nothing to offer God and no way to earn their way to God. Those people, they're the ones who are in the kingdom. They, they know they have nothing to offer God. They can pull out their pockets, spiritually speaking, of all their riches and know they have nothing to offer God. And then they can look at the holiness of God and their situation and know there is no way to earn my way to God. And as such, they're brought to this place of such shameful desperation that they're very much like the picture here. They're a beggar. They're a pauper. They see their situation and they're so ashamed. It's like that, I've been preaching this so many times out of Luke, that illustration with the tax collector and, and, and the Pharisee. And the Pharisee, you know, the tax collector is like talking, bragging about all of his religious things that he does. He, he tithes out of his spice rack, like, look at how awesome I am. And, and the the tax collector is so ashamed of himself, he doesn't even look in the direction. Luke 18, 13 says, so ashamed he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the poverty of the one whose is the kingdom of God. Nothing to bring nothing and no way to earn, who just cries out to God and depends entirely on his grace. His is the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. You been there? Do you live from that place? Right? Do you know it? Do you know this to be true of you? Because listen, heaven and hell hangs in the balance. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For yours is the kingdom, not will be. Right now. Is the kingdom. Right now, by faith in Christ Jesus, you are a joint heir with him. That's the blessing of the poor or of poverty. But then he continues on this, the blessing of hunger. And one of the things you're gonna have to see, guys, as we go through this is they build on each other. So watch as they build. I'll keep noting it. They're building one atop of another, okay? I'll show it to you here. The blessing of hunger. First blessing, okay, was the blessing of poverty, right? That blessing, you recognize what is wrong, or in other words, you're recognizing what you don't have. That's the first one. Have you made that recognition? I know what I don't have. I don't have anything to offer God. I don't have a way to earn myself a place with God in his good favor. I don't have that. Now, this one is not about what I don't have. That's already been covered. Now it's about I know what I want. He's moving us in a direction. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. 
Now he's talking about what he doesn't have, but what he wants, what he longs for in his heart, what his deepest desires are. Man, I, I hunger. Now again, Luke provides the simpler version, but Matthew explains the kind of hunger that Jesus is speaking of in Matthew 5 verse 6 that says it's a hunger and thirst after righteousness. Have you had that moment where you're just brought face to face on your knees before God and you're like, man, I have nothing to give you, God. Everything I have is filthy rags anyway. I have no way to earn my way. You are far too holy for anything I could put before you. And I have this desperate longing for righteousness. I want to know you. I want to be known by you. I want a life that pleases you. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about this knowing that you have approval with God, knowing that you have acceptance with God, saying in your heart, I mean, I want to be right with God. I am desperate for righteousness. I am desperate. I'm faint for a life that pleases you. I don't want anything else. I am starving for this. Have you been there? It's not to the one that goes, I have righteousness. It's the one going, I need it. I want it. I, I know I, I hate sinning. Do you hate sinning? I know we do it, but do you hate it? Does it still bring you to tears? Because you shouldn't be disappointed. It brings you to tears. You should say, that's the sign of the kingdom bound. It says, if that's where you are, then good news, you shall be satisfied, he says. You shall be foddered up that's what that word literally means. You know what fodder is? Got some farmers in the house? It's the stuff you feed animals. I like calling it that stuff. It sounds scientific, you know. It's the stuff, the stuff you feed animals. <laughs> but I, I don't know about you, but like, um, I love driving down 65 when the cows are out there. Anyone like that? When they put the sheep out there? Like the sheep guy, they rent that, they rent land, and then the sheep go out for a long, you've seen this, right? It's like, one of the things that sounds me is no matter how many times I go by, the cow's always eating. <laughs> Don't they eat just nonstop? They just eat and eat and eat and eat. It's just they're always eating. Some of you are like, that's exactly how I want to live, and you can't do it because your stomach, no matter how big you're making it, the cow just seems to eat, it doesn't stop. It's kind of what he's saying. I'm going to feed you with so much righteousness you're going to be stuffed. For those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be so completely satiated with righteousness. I am going to give you the righteousness of another. I'm going to give you the righteousness of my own son imputed to your account through faith alone in Jesus. You are going to be stuffed with righteousness. You will, credited to your account by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, have the most gloriously satiated Appetite for righteousness, it'll be completely covered. Psalm 107.9 says it like this, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul. He fills with good things. Are you hungry for righteousness? Because in Christ, God will fill you to the brim with the righteousness of his own son. You will be satisfied. Then he gets to the next blessing and he's moving one on top of another and he calls it the blessing of grief, the blessing of poverty, the blessing of hunger, the blessing of grief. By the way, this list is hilarious, isn't it? It's like every kid that graduates from college are like, you know what I'm gonna set my sights on? how poor I can be, how hungry I can be, and how much I can cry. <laughs> That's my goal. The parents are like, I just dropped 150K on that. Wow. <laughs> you have not grown up to be the kid I wanted you to be. I mean, it just flips it, doesn't it? We can be totally honest. We'll be honest with the woes, okay? We'll be honest with the woes. Here's the next link in the values of the kingdom, okay? Blessed are the poor, they see their need. The blessing of the hungry, they're hungry for what they lack. The blessing of grief, and they're sad about that. 
tracking? You see what you lack, you have a desire for what you don't have, and you're crushed over it. I mean, you are grieving this reality in a sense that I'm talking about that leads to repentance kind of sense of grieving. You know what I'm saying? A change of mind that leads you in a change of direction away from the things you were doing following your own pattern and towards Jesus. I'm talking about the kind of grief described by Paul in 2 Corinthians 7 when he says he calls it a godly grief. And he says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. That kind of grief. Not a grief you got caught. Not a grief that you butchered a relationship because of it. Those are sad things, but that's not the grief that we're talking about here. This is a weeping and wailing before the Lord. This is a Psalm 51. My sin is against you and you only, O oh God. I've got vertical, I got horizontal sin issues for sure with other people, but right now I am so consumed with you. I have sinned against you and I am weeping and wailing over my condition before you, God. This is a person who has just done making excuses, right? The kingdom-bound one weeps and wails over their state without Jesus Christ, knows they're so desperate and just doesn't make any excuses, doesn't rationalize their sin in any way. They're so grieved, they're grieved into repentance. They're grieved into a faithful repentance or a repentant faithfulness in Jesus. And it says for those people, who weep and wail now over their sins, you'll be the laughers in the end. You'll be the laughers. That this is the theme that the Bible has been talking about for so long. God's going to turn your mourning into joy. That, that, that is replete in the Old Testament. And then it's picked up again and again in the New Testament. In fact, the same verb's being used in James when he says, let your laughter... He says, take your laughter, if that's where you are, let it be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Guys, apart from Jesus Christ, you are the laugher. And he's saying, you may laugh, but I pray that your laughter would turn to mourning and that your joy would turn to gloom and that you would humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you because those who do theirs is the laugh of the free. Theirs is the laugh of the forgiven. You know that joy when you just know, I have such a confidence in Jesus Christ. Like, I don't care what comes my way. My righteousness is built off the finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross. My sins have been paid for because of that finished work of Jesus Christ on that cross and his resurrection, his life, his death, his resurrection. I put all my eggs in that basket. I trust in him completely, totally, and fully insofar as every fiber of my being is trusting in Jesus. That is the one who will laugh. The laugh of the forgiven, the laugh of the loved. <laughs> When you know Jesus as your savior, you know the most intimate love you could ever know. And that is reason to celebrate. It's reason that we'll be laughing. It's reason that Christians should have just ultimate joy. Does this describe you? Have you been here? You go, man, it's been a long time since I felt that, those things. Here's what I would say. Even if you've been a Christian for a long time, do you live from these realities? Please, 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 please don't ever graduate out of this. Like there was a day that I mourned. There was a day I hungered. I don't hunger anymore. Oh, loved ones, be warned today. Here, here's what you need to pray today. God, God dust off the cobwebs of my heart. Help me with the stiffness of my approach to you, of my callousness of my heart. And soften me to you, to these realities again. Because man, if we are not softened to this, if we don't live from this, I'm not saying every day is like this, but if we don't live from this, Christians who have been Christians for a long time, we should be concerned. 
And, and then he gets to this last one. And these, again, these all come together. You're going to see it, how it plays out. The blessing of rejection. Verses 22 and 23. And he says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man. All right, there's a shift here going on, guys. The order of these matters. The fourth blessing assumes the work of the third. First three have already been done. You have to understand that as you're reading this. What I mean by that is these changes have happened for you. You have already gone from poverty to riches. You've already gone from being hungry to being satisfied in Christ. You've already gone from sorrow, but unto sorrow through repentance into laughter. And now your life has changed. And now what you want to see is now that I'm a believer, now that I'm one walking with Jesus, how do I know that I have signs of kingdom boundedness in me? And he says, as soon as you start people seeing, hearing, listening to people saying all kinds of evil against you on the account of Jesus' name, then you'll be like, that's the sign. And because that's the sign, you rejoice. You don't wallow. That's the sign Jesus said. He, that, that's, that's affirming. That's comforting. That's, that's gracious of God to give me something that I would know when it comes my way, it would be like a ding, 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 ding. You are kingdom bound, friend. That's what he's saying here. And so when you experience hate on account of Jesus, when you experience reviling on account of Jesus, when you experience social persecution on account of Jesus and your friendships, wherever they may be, that is your cue to rejoice. Rejoice in that day, he says. Rejoice in that day, not in every day. Listen, if every day is a persecution day, something's probably wrong with your personality. Okay? I will say that. I'm so bold with the gospel, everyone hates me. Okay. Large portion of that is probably because everyone just hates you as a person, and you should work on that. Get some eyes on you. Ask your small group this week, is there something wrong with me? Small groups? I'm serious. Be honest with them. Gracious? Honest. Yes. Tell your face, right? Stuff. Encourage them. It's the way you come off. It's how you seem right all the time. Right? Help them. That was a side note. That had nothing to do with this. <laughs> Rejoice in that day. Not every day. Rejoice in the day of persecution. Leap for joy. I mean, get to dancing, y'all. Here's the thing that's so foreign to me. I don't. Anyone else, when you get persecuted, you just totally get fetal position, sad, woeful, woe is me. Anyone just like, you know? Ah, it feels like a sound of music or kind of moment. I don't know, like a musical should come out. But Jesus is like, man, and he's commanding this, by the way. This isn't an option. Like, hey, I'd really like you to think about rejoicing. He's like, I'm Lord, rejoice. Rejoice is a consistent command. You are commanded to rejoice. You are commanded to continual rejoicing when you are persecuted socially. And he gives two reasons why. Number one, forward-looking. Number two, backward-looking. Rejoice because you are amassing a reward in heaven. And listen, we as kingdom-bound ones should live with the realities of the future age so in front of us that we actually live like it's true right now. Problem is, we have too much distance between what's true of us right now, yet we'll be experiencing its consummate glory in the future, and that separation keeps us from being like, oh, I feel bad for myself. Instead, we should be rejoicing. And if we live with that future reality right here, we would. And then he goes, rejoice too, because you're in the right camp, right? You're in the right camp, meaning if you look backwards, all the prophets of old were in the same place you are. That's a good place to be. You're like, what camp should I be in? Be in the prophet's camp. And it was Stephen, after all, who said in the book of Acts, which of the fathers did your, excuse me, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? The most faithful servants of God in the Old Testament were ones who were persecuted. So rejoice. 
You're finding yourself in the right camp. You're with the right saints of old that the Lord by his grace is pleased to welcome into his kingdom. That's why you're blessed. In a sense here, really all six of these verses are about kingdom blessings. So as we get to the woes, it's like, what's up with that? It's not whoa, right? Just making sure we know which woe this is. It's not when you're like on a zip line, you're like, whoa, it's, it's not that, right? I don't even know how to say, is it W-O-A-H, right? With an exclamation point, I think is how we'd spell that. Not that, whoa, you catch a wave, whoa. No, it's whoa, woe unto you. It's the idea of cursing, right? Now, now there's, there's a divine pity in this, though. Like, this word carries this expression of pity for those who, by the woe, Jesus declaring the woe, is saying you stand under divine judgment. So as we move from the blessings to the woes, we, we get a sense that now we're, these are bound from the kingdom categories, but Jesus isn't doing it to say, and stay there. You're there, you're stuck, right where you are. You're not bound for the kingdom and you're out. I just wanted everyone to know it. That's why I said it. No, no, no. Jesus' heart is that by showing who's bound from the kingdom and the practices and conduct that binds you from the kingdom, by showing these things, it would actually draw people to the way of truth. That as he gives the false way in these woes, he would bring people to the way of truth truth. And so now we get to the curses, the curses that bind from the kingdom. And we don't need as much time going through these because the first blessings will parallel the curses. Here are the ones who Jesus is warning, stand under divine judgment, but with a heartfelt pity, Jesus preaches this in the hope that eyes would be opened and people would turn from their ways and come to the way of truth, come to the place of the kingdom bound, the ones who are poor and hungry for righteousness and mourn over it, and then in following Jesus are persecuted for it. Again, the four woes are like the four basic pursuits of life, aren't they? It's, this is what's so interesting. This is what's so challenging about it. Let's go back to the college illustration, right? Parents drop a lot of money into that college education. They want you coming out thinking, I'm going to get a job. I think that's reasonable, right, parents? Drop six figs into that thing, you're like, get a job. Be useful in some way, right? But every, every kid worth their salt, comes out going, here are my thoughts for life. I want to pursue riches, fullness, happiness, and I want to be liked. Isn't that what we're all going after? Let's just be honest. Come on. I know this is church, right? We can't be honest at church, but the Lord knows our hearts. We're like, oh, I'm not about riches. Oh, we love riches. I'd rather be rich than poor. Riches? You want to be liked or not liked? I don't care if anyone likes me. Okay. Full or hungry? Laughing or mourning, right? Here's the issue. Riches, fullness, happiness, and being liked. The issue isn't that those are bad things. The issue is that if you find these things apart from Christ, it can lead to exclusion from their true realities. They're not bad things. But if you're so content with these in their form that you get shadow form until you get them in substantive form in and with Christ. That if you're content with the money you have now, the riches you have now, if you're content with the fullness that you have now, if you're content with the laughter that you have now, if you're content with the likeness that you have now, the concern is that you will be excluded from their true realities as they're found in and through Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So, let's work it. Meant to draw us to the truth, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to the rich, 
or the curse of the riches. Woe to who? Woe to you who put a premium on your possessions, on your stuff, and so pay little heed to Jesus. You're rich. You don't need to listen to Jesus. Woe to you. Woe to you who find your security in your stuff and therefore don't need a savior. How about a spiritual side? Woe to those who think they have enough spiritual resource to merit entrance on their own into God's kingdom. Seems like every quasi-religious person you meet to share the gospel with will tell you they're a pretty good person. Apart from Jesus Christ, they stand under judgment. And that's not like, ha ha, we Christians are better than you. Don't ever give that off. We're all beggars, remember? We're all beggars. And Jesus is saying it to woo us out of that slumber, that blindedness that riches can have. Because if not, what's the curse? Well, you've received your comfort in full. After this, you will have no consolation. Your riches are it. This is the best it will ever get for you, but you won't have any coming in the future. You want it, you got it. It's a terrible judgment. The curse of fullness. He continues on. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. You think full now, full of what? Woe to you who are full of yourself. You're so full of yourself. You're so full of your accolades. You don't even see it. You are consumed. You're full of what you've accomplished and what you've accumulated. So you're good. Man, I'm good. I don't need any of that stuff. I don't need any of that Jesus stuff. I don't need any of that God stuff. I don't need any of that religion stuff. I'm good. I have my sights set on all the things. Look at my walls. Look at my, look at what I've accomplished. No need for grace. No need for God. I am stuffed full of my own stuff. The problem is, you're going to be hungry in the future. You may be full now, but you're going to want to satisfy a nagging hunger that you will never be able to satisfy on into eternity. Woe to the hungry or to the full, blessing to the hungry who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The curse of laughter. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. He's saying, to the smugly content. Woe to the one who's happy with your life the way it's going. You ever heard someone say that? I'm just happy with my life the way it's going. I don't need any of that stuff that you guys do, that God stuff, that Jesus stuff. I am happy the way things are. Woe to you. I am happy with my beliefs the way they are. I have my truth, capital M. Woe to you. I am happy with my morality. I am going to trust in that. Woe to you. I am happy with my take on life, with my take on God, with my belief about life after death or lack thereof. Woe to you. I am content with eating and drinking and just living and laughing it up. That's what I want to do. And Jesus is saying, woe to you. You laugh now but into eternity you will weep and you will wail. And it's so hard to see because you're doing so much laughing now. I don't want to take this serious. I don't want to listen to this guy. I don't want to listen to, how old is he? He can't be older than 14. Okay? What does he know? Just what Jesus is saying. Like my authority is not me. My authority is this this book. Jesus is really clear. And then he says, woe to the popular. Woe to the popular. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, 
For so their fathers did to the false prophets. He's going, woe to you if you've kind of found a middle way between no religion and religion. No Christianity and a little bit of Christianity. Woe to you who have taken maybe a spin on Christianity or religion and designed a spiritual way that leads everyone to speaking well of you. Woe to you. Woe to you if you have that kind of a ministry where you offend no one, you disrupt no one, you displease no one. You made everything seem good. No one needs to change anything because no one's a sinner. No one needs to repent of anything because that would imply something about you. Woe to that person for that is exactly how their fathers did it with the false prophets. They loved the false prophets, right? When you talk about the true prophets, you didn't talk about the true prophets as, man, they had it good. They preached the truth and they got hooked up, coupons, Four seasons, they were just like, man, bring it on. No, they faced rejection and persecution because they preached the truth. But if you can find a way to like weave Christ into this nobody's offended by anything kind of idea, if you can find a way to weave Christ in, that's exactly what they did with the false prophets. The false prophets loved preaching lies to the people they wanted to hear. Jeremiah 5.30, it says that the false prophets ruled in their own authority. Micah 2.11 says they preached what people wanted to hear. Jeremiah 6.14 says they preached peace, peace when there is no peace. In other words, these false prophets are saying everything's good here. You're all fine. You're all good. Just the way you are. No need to repent. No need to trust in Jesus. No need to change anything. Woe to you. This is so hardcore blue pill, isn't it? There is religion out there just like this, right in Christianity. And that is such a dangerous message. It's such a damning message. And Jesus says, woe to those who pursue this. Jesus is going to end up putting a premium on the obedience to his word. And we're going to see that because this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And remember by the end, he says, blessed is the one who hears my words and obeys them. For they're going to be like someone who built their house on a, do you remember? Yeah, a rock, a solid foundation. But then he says something else about the ones who hear the words of Jesus, but don't actually obey the words of Jesus. They will be those that built a house with no foundation And what does Jesus say? Great will be the fall. Oh, I'm praying that God would give us all by his spirit, not only ears to hear, but eyes to spiritually see the truth and the enablement by the Holy Spirit to respond in obedience to what is here, to turn in a repentant way, change of mind leading to a change of life and put your faith in Jesus and or to recover as a Christian, the foundation of the life of the kingdom bound. Let's pray. Father, this is my desire that our body would be built up and encouraged in the words of the Sermon on the Mount, that even Jesus' woes would be wooings to you, Jesus, that you would, by your warnings, draw people to yourself. And those who do belong to you, Lord, would found themselves upon the foundational principles of the kingdom bound, knowing they're poor in spirit, having an insatiable hunger for righteousness, grieving over their sin, and walking in such obedience to you that the world responds in a way that looks like rejection. But let us rejoice, for great is our reward. God, thank you for all of that truth. Make it true in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.